Hi, I'm CJ Albertson, and you're listening to the Mental Game Podcast. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Mental Game Podcast. Sam Brief here. I'm at the home studio in Chicago, right on the course of the Chicago Marathon, which just finished up a few weeks ago. And I've got the top American finisher, CJ Albertson, joining today to talk all about his mental process in crushing the Chicago Marathon, a personal best time, two hours, eight minutes, 17 seconds, absolutely wild, and finishing almost two and a half full hours ahead of yours truly. Yes, indeed, I did run the Chicago Marathon, raising a little over $3,000 for the Alzheimer's Association. I did it in 4.31.12. I was just trying to finish. It was my first marathon. The mental game stayed strong, physical game was all right, and I was really proud to finish. But this one is all about CJ, and what CJ Albertson has accomplished is incredible. Finishing seventh overall, his mental process is behind a lot of it, and he makes a really good point about the mental game. It's not so much his mental process on race day as he's going in Chicago. It's what he's done for his whole life. It's what he's done for the 100-mile weeks of training that lead up to the marathon. I think you'll really be interested in what CJ has to say because, quite frankly, it's some ideas that you've never heard on the mental game, and you probably have never read and never thought about much like me. So without further ado, one of the top marathon runners in America and among the best in the world. He'll run the New York Marathon next. He just crushed Chicago, and it's CJ Albertson coming in in three, two, one. Hi, Sam. Thanks for having me. CJ, it's awesome to have you. And it's an interesting time for you because your body is simultaneously recovering from your triumph in Chicago and getting prepped for hopefully another triumph in New York. So what's the physical mental state of CJ Albertson right now? I know it's a complicated question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, overall, I think I'm pretty good. Uh, just, you know, after Chicago, um, you know, it takes a few days to recover from a real hard event, just like any kind of hard workout section or, or anything that you do, you know, a, a really big meeting or whatever. Um, you, you always take a few days to kind of come down from that, but then you kind of settle back into your normal routine. So now I'm just, you know, in the normal swing of things, going throughout my days, um, you know, doing my, you know, my running workouts and my daily life activities. Um, so, yeah, right now I'm just kind of in the normal flow and then I'll travel again next Thursday um, and kind of get into that race mode for New York. I want people to understand a little bit about what the the normal flow is for you because it's very unique. You run 100 plus miles a week. You have kids. You teach and coach at Clovis. So what's a normal week like? Yeah, so I'll have um, I, I coach at community college, cross country team. So we have practice, you know, every, every day in, in the mornings typically. So when they're as, as we're practicing, usually I can get a run in as well. It just kind of depends on on what we're doing, um, what type of workout we're doing, how much, you know, I'm able to run. And um, but yeah, so I have that. And then um, I'll be teaching on on s select days. I don't have I don't have actual like classes that I'm in person teaching every day. Um, but usually I have a mix of online and in person classes. Um, and then use so then that will be through the day. And then I'll usually have a second workout in the afternoon where I'll run um, just by myself. Our team doesn't practice twice a day, but so I'll have that afternoon workout to just, you know, do whatever running workout I need to do. Um, and then, you know, come home and whatever, just finish, finish up stuff. If I have, if I have some work I need to do, or just, you know, be, be with my um, family and, and kids. And normally I'm pretty tired after my second run. So I'm just kind of like, just doing what I can and, um, you know, um, somewhat helping my, my wife put the kids to bed, but she does like the, the vast majority of it. And I'm just kind of, you know, there and, and, and trying to do a little bit of I can, but usually by, yeah, by the afternoon, evening, I'm like, I'm just, you know, barely making it. Yeah. I, that That's the type of day where I think a lot of people, they'd go through it once and become pretty much a zombie but you're going rinse and repeat day in, day out. You've actually called yourself a functional zombie, and yet you're 
operating at peak efficiency. I mean, you crushed it in Boston, crushed it in Chicago. And CJ, I want to get to Chicago because you are so fresh off of that, finishing seventh overall, setting a personal best, and the top American finisher. Uh, what did it mean to you to check that box? It felt great. Uh, I knew I was capable of it. Um, my training had gone really well. Um, in past, you know, in, in past marathons, I've done pretty well. And the, the time necessarily hasn't been like quite as fast as I thought I could run. But going into Chicago on a really fast course, again, my training had gone really well. I knew if I just executed and had a good race uh, that I'd be able to run around, you know, to, to a weight low like the time I ran. So it felt good to actually do it and have that performance that I knew I was capable of. Um, so, yeah, definitely walked away feeling good. Of course, so much of running is physical. I mean, you have to train your body like hell. You have to recover right. You have to stretch. You have to massage. All these things go into a great performance. But there's also the mental side of it, of course. That's why I have you on this show. I'm curious to what extent you see the mental side playing a factor. I think a lot of people view the mental side as far as what is happening in the race. You know, like your, your mental mindset or whatever you know, in that moment of a marathon. Um, but for me, running isn't, I mean, there is a mental side, like you definitely have to mentally execute while you're in a race, but the mental component really comes into play the months and years, you know, before that one race. And so, um, I feel like the, the, uh, the ratio, because you know, running, it's like, what is what is the ratio of? Is it mental? Is it physical? Some people say it's all mental, and it's like, well, it's not all mental. It's there's a lot of physical, but I think the I think the ratio of mental to physical um, changes to actually being more physical on race day, um, or at least it should, I think. And so, um, but like, how physically fit you are and what your body's capable of doing is so much of that is determined by your by your mindset um, and what you're able to do in training the months leading up to that. Um, so, you know, for my, my performance is like in the race, I had to be, you know, I had to have some mental strength. I had to rely on some strategies of staying calm, staying relaxed um, for most of the race. Then when it got hard, reminding myself like, okay, um, you know, I'm, I'm still doing fine. I'm still running a good pace. Like I don't need to press and make this really hard I just need to I just need to like stay calm and run wh what I know I can run and I know I can close hard at the end um you know I know I'm I'm strong like you know I'm repeating things I tell my own athletes so there are like a little bit of mental strategies that I've worked on and that I'm implementing in the race but getting to the fitness to run the 20817 it has been just years and years of of mental work that allows me to you know, to train and, and run, you know, 120 miles a week and to do really like long workouts and hard long runs um, and be able to be like consistent while I'm doing that. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to like describe all the mindset and all those months and years, you know, leading up to it. But I think it's, it's just a, it's just an overall attitude of like, um, you know, I'm my I'm gonna have days that fluctuate. So I'm not not every day is gonna be good. Some days are gonna be not good. But it's like in the end, like I believe I'm going to be successful. I'm going to have a good race. I'm going to meet my goals. Um, and so and in training, I have that sort of mindset that like not every day needs to be great. It's like I already I already kind of know the end result. I know it's gonna be solid. So like I don't have to freak out if I have a bad day or if I, you know, have a little small injury or a workout doesn't go good. Um, and then that just allows me to be more at peace and calm throughout the day. Um, and those lower levels of stress just allow you to physically adapt better. They allow you to, to run each workout a little bit more consistently. Um, so you get better execution from the workout. And then again, you recover better from the workout because you're just in a better overall I don't know, homeostasis type state. Um, so yeah, it's it's not just the race. It's literally all of your life, you know, leading up to that moment. And that sounds a little bit daunting, like all of your life, like you have to be mentally on all the time. I mean, no, you can definitely have bad moments for sure. 
but it's just it's just like the principle or the idea. It's compound interest, right? I mean, I would liken it almost to if you go to a great five star restaurant, Michelin star, you got this fancy chef, he serves you an amazing meal. It's not because he was super locked in on that day and just had the mindset and the technique perfect on that day. It's his lifetime of expertise. It's going to culinary school in France and practicing every day for like 20 years and then serving you the steak and it tastes really good. Your performance in Chicago, it's not like everything lined up perfectly, right? You had this mindset of years, decades of training and it ends up paying off in the end. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there's still You're you know, the chef. And, yeah. And and there may be one out of 10 steaks that the chef doesn't get perfectly right but still probably going to be a lot better than whatever i can make (laughs) now we're vibing on the analogy and it's probably better than i can make too um now i'm kind of hungry for steak but let's keep talking shop and and then maybe we can eat post pod so cj i think it was really interesting what you said at the beginning of your mental thoughts which was about the comment that people make in running and in pretty much every sport, which is, oh, it's all mental. <laughs> Running's all mental. Baseball's all mental, right? Like, the, I laugh at that. As the host of the Mental Game podcast, I crack up at that. Like, running is not all mental. You have to work. You have to run. Um, the connection between mental and physical when it's on is where the beauty happens. How much does your mind affect your running? You say you can run more consistently when the mental game's on. It's definitely physical as far as, like, everything that you're doing when you're running is is physical and so if you don't have the fitness you're not going to be able to do it no i mean um you know like most people in the world if they race me in a marathon doesn't really matter how good their mental strength is like i'm going to beat them just because i'm dude i'm pretty i'm pretty mentally strong i finished 431 12 i don't think i have a shot against you yeah so yeah, but but like when you are getting better physically, like a lot of that is mental. Um, and 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 it kind of can go back to like, I mean, there there can be tons of different psychological principles. Um, like even like our your mindset could affect like neuroplasticity or how you adapt to things. So like if you go into training with the mindset that like, you know that that you can actually get better and that like you're expecting to get better. Um, or you view a certain pace as this is achievable or this is normal even, then it's hard to like find some exact formula as to why you're able to achieve that. But there's something in the body, there's some sort of, I don't know, physical adapt- adaptation that takes place that actually makes you better. So I think it, this is easy to see on teams. Um, you know, there'll be teams like cross country teams, for example, that they just win every year or they're, they're, they're one of the best every single year. And it's like, do they really have the top five most talented people 15 years in a row? Like probably not, especially like high schools where like, they're not recruiting, you know, it's not like, it's not because they're famous, like they're, they're recruiting and getting these good athletes. Like it's just the kids that happen to live in that area. Like, are they the five best every year? And it's like, probably not. Sometimes it's a little bit of the coaching, um, like as far as the workouts, but a lot of people do the same physical training. Like if you compare people's, you know, training programs, they're very, very similar. Um, So what is it? Like why are the same teams always the best, more or less doing the same training that, you know, it can't just be pure talent every single year. And it's, there's something about like the perception of what's fast, what's expected of me what can i do and it just changes how you adapt physically so you know those teams are like let, let's say like 18 minutes for a 5k girl like that's just like for one team that is just really fast like those paces are just really hard we're, we're not going to be able to do that in practice but for another person it's like they might you know maybe they're only running 21 minutes but like 18 minutes is expected on that team like tons of us are doing it we can all do it and like over the four years of high school you just gradually chip away expecting that when you're a senior like you're gonna run those times and then again i don't know how to quantify the science but your training is just your adaptation to training is just different and you're more likely to run that pace in the end um 
and all the work that you do, you know, maybe you're doing a workout and you perceive 630, 630 miles, you perceive that as really hard. And it's just like, uh, you're just straining through the whole workout. It's very stressful. It's just hard. And like you did it. But then you're in an environment or but the flip side is like you're in an environment where like, OK, those 630 miles, they're they're just normal. It's just what we do. And you run it. You have the same physical output on paper as far as like the force that you're outputting. But there's just something about the body, something about the the stress response state that it was it was it was hard and it triggered some adaptation, but it wasn't overly stressful. So then you have this room or this capacity to to um, have energy after the workout to then allow your body to to go in and recover and adapt. And it's just and the cumin the cumin to live less stress. I don't even know what to call it. Like just it really adds up over time. Um, and so you can be you know you can be physically faster. So. For me right now, one thing I'm trying to do is just reset my brain as far as what is is fast. So like I, you know, I'm, my PR, I just before this race, my PR was 209.53. It's about four minutes, 57 seconds for a mile or per mile for the marathon. Um, I would like to be able to run more in the 206 range, um, at least for, for right now. So like running four minutes and 50 seconds per mile. Well, to do that, I need to like my my speed workouts need to a little, be a little bit faster. So realistically, if I'm going to run 450 for a marathon, running at least under 440 should feel pretty comfortable, like somewhere in the 430s. So then if I slow down to 450, it's like, OK, I can hold this for over two hours. Um, but those paces have kind of intimidated me. And like if I'm running under 440 pace, like in the past, like that's been that's been hard. Like I, I really, I'm going to have to really work hard to do this. If I'm preparing for a workout that's under 440 pace, it's like, I, I, I don't really want to do this. I don't know if I can do this. This is hard. So now I'm trying to like reshift that as like, no, like 430 for a mile, like, isn't that fast. Like 430 is normal. Like I can run 430s. Um, Cause I know if I eventually do that and I can do all my faster workouts at 430 pace, I'm going to be able to run 450 pace or under for a marathon. Um, so I also will look at other guys' workouts, like some of my competitors, and I will see them doing workouts at those times that I would like to run. And like I just see them doing it. And in the past, I would maybe see them and be like, wow, like that's fast. Like they're in such great shape or whatever. And it would like kind of feel like intimidating, like, okay, I can't do that, but I can do something else. Or like maybe I can't do that, but I'm better at long runs. But now it's like I look at it and I still initially like I see the numbers and I'm like, that's that's fast. But then I sit with that. And I'm like, it's, it's, it's not fast. Like that is normal. That I'm just seeing something that I can also do. And then the next time I go out for a workout, like literally yesterday I was doing mile repeats and I'm just repeating to myself like, 430 isn't fast like 430 isn't fast so I'm not my goal wasn't to try harder and to push harder to hit that 430 my goal was to like get into a state where I'm running 430 pace and it feels like natural like this is what I'm supposed to run this is this doesn't require a superhuman effort it just requires me to just be a runner just be me and I can run that pace so so then long term, those mindsets that are then shifting my perspective, shifting the actual paces that I do run in practice, but keeping the effort, the perceived effort the same, that's going to enable me to then run those marathon paces faster. And it's not just going to be when I get into the marathon, I'm just like, oh, I'm going to just be super tough today and I'm going to run five seconds a mile faster than I've ever ran. It's like, that's, 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 that's not going to work. I mean, to some degree, like you still have to execute, but it's going to happen all the, slowly chipping away, slowly changing my mindset throughout the course of weeks, months, you know, even years. That is so cool. That is so fascinating, dude. I mean, the the way that you look at perceived effort versus effort, like they're two different things, right? There's what your body is actually doing, the pumping of your arms and the moving of your feet at a certain pace. 
And then there's what you're telling yourself. I mean, you're saying, hey, 430 is not that fast, not that fast. And over time, it becomes just normal. Now, is that you talking to yourself in your head as you're running? Is that in between runs? Is that when you wake up in the morning? Uh, tell me what that self-talk looks like. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is is while I'm running. Um, again, sometimes when it, it, sometimes it's when I'm looking at other people's workouts and just it's it's even changing how I react to to seeing like um, like if I you know see someone do a workout and it's like okay they ran those times and I'm like oh that's fast it's like again as I mentioned before I kind of sit with that and like like okay but it's it's not that fast like that is normal so I like I can't control everything so like when I first look at it I still have that tendency of like whoo that's fast but then but that slowly changed and like I look at that and it's like okay that's 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 normal um, or I look at race times and, you know, like I used to use, I mean, when I was first starting out running marathons, like when I'd see, you know, some guys run like under 215 or something, it's like, oh, that's, that's fast. Like, that's good. Like, you know, that, that kind of intimidates me. And like now, like, I mean, I've run seven minutes faster than that. So I don't, those same times don't necessarily intimidate me or I don't think of them as fast. Now I'm looking, um, you know, and then it was like people break 210. I'm like, okay, that's, that's good or whatever. And then like, but now it's, I'm, it's just like what I perceive the time. Like even when I ran 208, I didn't really perceive that as that fast. Whereas a few years ago, I would have perceived that as, as really fast. Um, and it would have required like an incredible day an incredible effort to do that. And maybe even something that felt outside myself. Whereas when I ran it in Chicago, it was, I didn't necessarily feel like I had an amazing day. I just was normal. And that's just what normal is now. Um, so it's, I don't think you need to think about it all the time. I think you can definitely overanalyze it and overthink it. Overthink it. So one of the benefits to having a somewhat busy life and, and having, you know, a career in coaching and teaching and, you know, being married and having kids is, I don't have to think about running every second of every day because I don't <laughs> you're not, you're probably that's just really hard and I don't think you'll be successful in that so it's like I don't want to always be thinking about running always analyzing these times I don't want my brain always on trying to like change myself it's just like but when I'm when I'm in those moments you know then it's working on them but then I can also I can also let go of those so in the other you know 14 hours I'm awake like I can live life and do have my mind be other places rather than exhaustingly fixating on something because I've also done that in the past where I, I think I naturally have a pretty obsessive um, fixating personality and when things get in my mind it's uh, very difficult it, and the past has been very difficult for me to let go of them and to stop thinking about them and so I never really got a lot of rest um, because my brain is just constantly going and kind of dwelling on things um, and so especially if things weren't going well it was like very exhausting because I, I couldn't stop thinking about that and for a while I didn't think that that was controllable like I don't know I kind of in a way just like accepted that's how I was but then it was like well that like yeah like that's those are the tendencies I've done in the past but that I don't have to just accept like that's how I am like I can just let those things go like I don't have to constantly think about things I can you know I can have the thoughts and I can just let them go and move on to whatever else balance I guess that's a key principle that people talk about a lot but that's that's something that has um, played a big role in my mental part as I've progressed as a as a runner and I guess just a human it's awesome to hear that I mean as a fellow human who can also get super obsessive I've also felt myself get sucked into that mentality of oh yeah I've got like kind of an addictive personality this is who I am so I'm gonna like think about this all day and next thing you know crap I'm burnt out right like, crap it all blew up you know so um, and a lot of people have been there. So it's really cool to hear your mentality of like, hey, maybe this is who I've been in the past. I'm not going to be obsessive. Yes, it's my career. Yes, I'm, I'm an elite runner, one of the best in America, one of the best in the world. But I have a life. 
outside of this. Um, and, and you're able to dedicate so much to the running and to the other stuff. Now, I hope what a lot of people can hear when they listen to this is, yeah, you've got CJ talking about how this all applies to elite marathoning, but anyone can have that sort of mental construct. Like maybe you're trying to get in shape and work out a little more and you're like, oh my God, working out five days a week is insane. I could never do that. Well, if you lower the perceived effort, oh, five days a week, I could do that. Next thing you know, it's easy, right? So so that's kind of a mental trick that uh, pays off and you show up on race day and suddenly, all right, let's go run. 208.17, easy breezy, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, and realistically, it's going to be a, like a you know you can't send you can't you can't have those mental brain resets be too big of a jump you know so if you've never worked out and you're just like for the next year i'm gonna work out every single day and it's just gonna be easy it's like well i mean for some for some there are a few people that all or nothing type things they they you know, naturally work a little bit better. So for some people, maybe they can't miss a day. And it's like, okay, I mean, I would challenge you to like not pig yourself in that little hole. Like just because you've been an all or nothing person in the past, maybe you can work on it, you know, but, um, but yeah, for the most part, those mental resets have to be small enough that they're realistic. And then you can make, you know, then you can make another jump after you get there. So maybe you say, you know, like, oh, like, 10 minutes continuous of running like that just seems oh, that, I don't know that seems like a lot but then you're like no I, I like 10 minutes of running that's not what I can do that okay well so you, you then you start to do it and you can do 10 minutes of running and then you're like oh well 15 minutes of running is you know that that that's normal or I can do like that's not super exhausting so then you can do 50 if you just jump like if you just you know you can't just jump from zero to like 60 60 like it's not gonna work so um but that kind of plays into goal setting too. It's like one thing I try to um, tell people or tell my athletes is like when you're setting goals, it's important for them to be realistic because when they're when they're too far when they're too far out there initially, um, it makes them less uh, stressful. Is not the right word, but you're 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 a little bit less disappointed if you don't hit them because in the back of your mind, you knew you weren't going to hit that anyways. Like, like it's like, this was a goal that really like you, I mean, it was so far out of your reach that I, you really probably didn't think you could do it. So, so then when you don't do it, it's kind of like, ah, well, yeah, I, you know, probably couldn't do that anyways, but you want something that is close enough that like it stings a little bit. Like, it hurts a little bit if you don't do it because you knew you were capable. Of. Like, so even when I'm doing a mental reset, like I don't just go straight to like, oh, 415 paces is easy. I can, I can run that in every workout. It's like, well, that no, like I can't do that. And I know I can't do that right now. So if I don't go out, if I go out and I don't run 415 pace, I'm not really upset. Like I knew I couldn't do that anyways. So, but having that little bit of stress where it's like, ah, oh, it stings a little bit if I don't get this, like, I feel like that's, that's motivating. Cause then it, then there's like, there's a little bit of stakes on the line. Cause you know, and like, you know, when you know you can do something, cause you feel a certain way when you, when you don't do it. Um, so I think that, that blend of, of realistic and I, I don't know. I feel like you just, it's just kind of some intuition. You just kind of know. And I feel like everyone can kind of know what I'm talking about when I say that. It's like you get to the end or you get to a race. Like you have a time goal that you knew deep down you could hit and you didn't quite hit it. And like it stings a little bit. Whereas like if like you weren't disappointed, you didn't break three hours because you probably didn't think you could break three hours. But no maybe way. you wanted to break 430 and you're like, ah, man, I, I knew I could do that. And it's like, those are the things that are going to elevate you in life that you deep down know you can do. They're still, they're still really hard. And it's going to take a lot of mental and physical work to get there. But it's like, but you know, you can. It's so cool to think about goal setting that way. And, and to be honest, I don't think I have, I don't think a lot of people do. What's your reaction going to be if you don't hit your goal is the question I'm hearing from you. And 
you know, I think about my own running journey, you know, I thought about it a lot in terms of distance. Like it used to be running two miles was nuts. Next thing you know, it's like, all right, I could do a 20 mile training run and then go do a 26.2 on marathon day. And obviously that's pushing it. This is my first one that's pushing it. And I accomplished it. Um, but now that feels attainable. So let's say next year I show up and I don't even finish. Well, then there's going to be a huge disappointment. That's an interesting way to think about goal setting. When you have a goal, CJ, how often are you thinking about that as you're running? Like within that 208.17 where you're on the course in Chicago? You're not always thinking about the long-term goal because I think when you have different workouts, you have like you have like goals within that workout. So, you know, whatever whatever workout I'm doing that day, like I have kind of like a pace target that I'm I'm trying to hit or or an effort that I'm trying to accomplish or kind of like a mindset like cuz it's not always paces. Sometimes it's more about how I feel, how I'm managing my energy throughout a, a run or a workout. Um and so I'm a lot of times I think I'm I'm more focused on the little small goal that I'm currently doing in the moment that that's going to lead to that big goal. Um, I'll think of maybe like the bigger goals, maybe on like more so like an easier run where I'm just kind of letting my mind wander. And it's like, uh, I'm kind of visualizing a race. So it's like, you know, I win a race or I run like some, you know, pretty good PR and it's fun. But like when I really need to do kind of focused mental work to execute a workout, then it's specific to that workout and what the goals within the workout are. Um, and I think like that, that, you know, it's kind of, yeah, that's probably more effective than just going back to the big long-term goal every time, because um, there's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily super specific to what you're doing in the moment. And that's where you get into the obsessive potential, right? And th there's just so much to think about in this sport in distance running, right? I mean, there are so many sports where, you know, it goes by in a flash, but this is not one of those. And your your marathon on race day takes a little over two-hour chunk, but then there's the 100-mile weeks, and you're just pounding the pavement over and over again. There's a lot of time for your mind to wander, and then there's your mind on race day. Do you ever try to, like, keep your mind blank or is it always churning and visualizing? Yeah, I mean, most mo most of it is trying to keep your mind blank. Um, that's why I kind of said it, going back to like the beginning of the podcast, the the sh the uh, split between mental and physical on race day, ideally should be mostly physical because you you've you've used your mentality to get you as fit as possible, and then ideally when you're racing, you're just letting your fear your your um, your pure physical body take over. And so it's not inhibited by anything from your mind. It's just all your energy is just dedicated to physical output. So your brain, um, for a lot of it, is just kind of blank. And your your body is just running what you've trained it to do, what you've practiced to do, the pace that you've, you know, conditioned it for. Um, and there'll be, you know, inevitably there'll be moments where like you have to make mental decisions you have to decide do i go with this pack do i not do i you know try to commit with this person or do i slow down to my own pace um you may have to like go back to a mantra or tell yourself something to kind of get you through a rough moment of the race um but then you but then once you get back into a good rhythm then you're just trying to keep your mind blank because you're not gonna like you're not gonna sit there and pump yourself up and talk positive to yourself or whatever whatever like good mental strategies there are you're not going to do that for two to five hours <laughs> in a race. Like it's just, that's like, I mean, that sounds exhausting. Um, so yeah. So I try to keep, keep your mind as quiet as possible. So then when you do have to use your mind, it's fresh and, and it can be effective for the, you know, maybe for the three to five minute hard stretch that you need to, to adjust or make a decision or get back on pace or whatever. If your mind is burnt out when you show up to the start line, it's not going to operate at peak efficiency during that big race. You need your mind fresh, and then you could let it rip. Before I let you go, I've seen online and read a lot about some of your training methods. You use some pretty interesting stuff. Training for the marathon trials, you used incandescent heat lamps to simulate 
the burning Orlando sun. I mean, those things are usually used in things like chicken coops. I mean, you, you've sat in your car for a long time to simulate the heat, stuff like that. You got any other new tricks up your sleeve? Um, I mean, I'm always doing random little weird things, but um, yeah, I think there's a blend. I mean, everything, even even those types of training things, um, the heat, for example, like when you train in the heat, you have like physical adaptations that take place. So your um, first, your plasma volume will will increase, and then it, I don't know if it's fully proven, but there's enough science now. Like after your plasma volume increase, your body typically wants to maintain a um, a hemoglobin concentration that's roughly the same. So since your plasma volume increases, usually you'll make a little bit more um, overall hemoglobin so that your your concentration stays the same. So um, so basically with more hemoglobin, you're able to transport more oxygen to your blood. I mean, I mean to your you have more oxygen in your blood that you can transport to your muscles, your performance increases. Um, and then also, you know, with the increased blood volume, your your sweating and cooling mechanisms, all those are a little bit enhanced as well. So if you're working out in hot weather, you're just able to sweat, evaporate, and cool yourself better. Um, so there's, there's those real physical adaptations where, like, when you run in the heat, it's going to be easier. But then mentally, your brain... Um, your brain also adapts to a higher core body temperature. So, you know, the first time you run in the heat and your core body temperature gets up to like 102, your brain's just like, no, we're done. Stop. Like, we don't want to die <laughs> because this isn't sa- like this isn't safe. And so there's so much strong feedback from your brain saying, stop, like you're going to die. <laughs> and it feels like that. I mean, if you've ever ran in the heat or the first super hot summer day like it literally feels like you're gonna die but your brain shifts and there's a whole central governor theory um i think tim noakes done a bunch of research on that and so then it's like i like to do all these types of different things because not only do i know the science of the physical adaptations but the more you do different stuff like your brain becomes more comfortable with it and your brain's like oh, okay we're not gonna die or at least we didn't die this time so I'll let you push the boundaries a little bit more. Like, you know, the the brain isn't going to send as strong of signals. Um, so yeah, I so I like to incorporate things, not necessarily just doing hard things. So I, I, I guess I'm sorry. I guess like when I do all these things that are a little weird or odd or that may seem hard um, or uncomfortable, I think it's good to do things that get you uncomfortable. But when you're doing them, you're you, you don't feel like they're hard and uncomfortable because because the part of the goal is to train your brain to think this is normal. I can still allow a high energy output while doing this. So like if I'm training in the heat, like I'm not sitting there suffering, but oh, that's so hot, so hard. I'm dying. Like part of it is thinking this is cool. Like I, I love this. Like I this is this feels great. So then my brain is like, yeah, like we've done this a hundred times now. You can you can push the limits. Like you can you can run hard and you feel fine. And so when we're in a race and you're hot and your core body temperature is getting high, we're not gonna shut you down. Like we're gonna let you keep going because it's it's fine. And so then when you're working out, you're doing a hard workout or whatever. I was even telling my athletes just today, it's like that uncomfortable feeling, like maybe you're doing like some speed work and like you haven't done a lot of speed work. It doesn't really feel good. You know, you're doing some hard 800 meter repeats or whatever. Your legs are kind of burning. You're breathing really hard. And you're just like, I just don't, I don't like this. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I don't like this feeling. It's like the goal isn't to like always push harder through that or have your perceived effort feel harder. The goal is to still run the same pace. So you don't slow down. You still run the same pace, but you're like, okay, this feeling, like, I still feel all this same stuff, but I'm perceiving it as this is okay. This is normal. This is fine. And I can just sit, I can just be here with these feelings. Um, So just naturally running, you're going to get a lot of that. But then if, you know, I like to also kind of create some scenarios like I have where you feel (laughs) different things that are uncomfortable and then you train your brain to be like nah these are fine it all comes back to training your brain and telling yourself 
this is normal. And it's normal even when you have these red incandescent heat lamps shining at you. It was so cool to see that, uh, the NBC broadcast of the marath- uh, the Olympic marathon trials where you're running on your treadmill and it's red. It looks super cool. And I, now I'm picturing you saying to yourself, this is normal. This is normal. I can do this. And then you go out in the Florida sun and suddenly your perceived effort can be lower. That's awesome. You are so locked in. It's so cool to hear the mental process. I'm wishing you all the success in the world at New York because you crushed Boston, you crushed Chicago. Uh, and next up is the New York City Marathon on the first Sunday of November. When are you leaving? Uh, next Thursday. So I think it's Halloween. Yeah. Spooky season. CJ, wishing you all the best. Thank you so much for joining the mental game. I learned a ton from you. I would think anyone who listened to even five minutes of this thing would take a ton of knowledge. So I hope they brought their notepads and we'll all watch you run now, CJ. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. That is an awesome, insightful conversation with CJ Albertson, top American finisher in Boston, top in Chicago, and I cannot wait to see what he does in New York. If you haven't already, Google the CJ Albertson heat lamp in his training for the marathon Olympic trials. It's awesome. I mean, the dude has all this red light, just scorching hot heat on him, on his treadmill at home to simulate what it would be like to run in Orlando under the hot sun. And he finished fifth at the Olympic trials. So it did definitely pay off. But CJ Albertson, a beauty and really appreciate him for sharing all that uh, and even for connecting it to some stuff that amateur runners like me or non-runners like you, whoever, whatever you're doing, uh, that mental process can definitely help you out. So this has been another edition of the Mental Game Podcast. Always appreciate you, not just for listening, but if you have a little bit of time to hit the subscribe button, to like it, to rate it, to review it, spread it to your friends, to your family, to your colleagues, every little bit definitely helps us in all the old you know little algorithms of the world so i've been your host sam brief i'll talk to you next time in the meantime make sure to take care of yourself take care of others this has been the mental game